All right, good morning, Hollywood Community Church. Bless God this morning. Amen. Very happy, very happy to be here in the house of God and uh, to have this opportunity to share with you all. It, it has been a while, I, I think at least a year, uh, but I believe I know why it's, it's been so long. I think it's because I, I picked on Pastor Brian so much <laughs> that, that he figured I needed some time off from preaching. But you, you know what, though, I, I decided that I am going to change my ways. And I, I know I said the same thing last year, but I've decided I'm not going to pick on Pastor Brian anymore. <laughs> so I, I've said all the, the Pastor Brian jokes that, that I am going to say. But, but I, I do love this man. I do love him. He is my brother. He is my friend. And he just gives me so much to work with when it comes to making fun of him. So it's <laughs> He is an awesome guy. If, if, if I haven't told you before, let, let me tell you, I, I, I have been blessed with the opportunity to know uh, so many pastors over the years that, that I have been involved in ministry. Uh, and, and Pastor Brian is one of the few that I know uh, that is so sincere in, in his work and the things that he does for God. This, this man eats, sleeps, and breathes to serve you all as a church. And you ought to be grateful and thankful uh, for the man that God has placed uh, over this house. Man. So do I get a raise for that, Pastor Brian? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I do finally get a chance to speak with you. And, and when I do, he, he gives me like a, a hundred verses to go over. But we're in John chapter 6 this morning. And uh, we, we have a, a quite a bit of ways to cover. And, and if, if you've ever been involved in, in any of uh, my teaching sessions, whether it's in a small group or, or sessions I do, uh, with my staff or sessions I do with the students at the school, you know I, I never finish anything. There's always more to be said. There's always more to be done. There's always that moment where we start digging in deep. Uh, but I want to do the best I can this morning to share in the Word of God with you because we have a powerful scripture uh, this morning. I think it's, it's relevant to whether you are a new believer or if you are a seasoned believer, there is a word for your heart this morning. Amen. Now, now, I am from the South, so you do have to talk to me just a little bit so that I, I know that you're listening. Uh, I, I'm going to share some of that, that with you all a little bit later, but I mean, I, I came up in an environment where I was used to, to having that confirmation that you're paying attention. Then God made me an educator, and as an educator, I needed even more. So if, if I don't hear anything, I may have to start calling on people to raise your hands and answering questions, but... But glory be to God, I, I am very excited that we have a chance to get into John chapter 6. So it's a lot. So I won't, I won't read all of it. I, I want to kind of summarize it and then hit on some of the, the main things that, uh, that we want to pull from this passage. Uh, but what's happening in, in John chapter 6 is, is there had been thousands upon thousands of people uh, who had been following Jesus. The, the Bible says it was about 5,000 people, uh, but that was only including the men, not counting the women and the children. So in reality, it, it was probably somewhere in the tens of thousands of people who were following Christ at this particular point. And that was this time when they had got into this remote location and they realized they didn't have enough food to feed all of these people. And, and Jesus sent the disciples out to find out what was there that was available. And they were able to find this young man who had two fish, five loaves of bread, and Jesus took the two fish and the five loaves of bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and fed the multitude of people. Skipping over the fact that that same day he walked across water, you know, that's, that's a little issue, that's nothing important, everybody does that all the time. But, but we, we moved to the next day. The next day, this same crowd is looking for Jesus. And they search hard, they search high and low, they search all over the city, and they couldn't find Jesus at all. Then they noticed that there were some of the boats missing, and, 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 and then they went and they, they found some boats that were coming. And they, they, still in their search, they, they went all over the sea, all the way across the sea, looking for Jesus, and they finally found Jesus. After all that searching, after all that hard toil. And, and Jesus told them, he, he said, you know what, you're not really looking for me because of the signs that you saw. You're really looking for me because of the food that was put in your belly. And isn't that really a replica of, of sometimes of how we seek Jesus? That there's sometimes that where we are searching after Jesus so hard, but really and truly, we're not really going after Jesus, we're going after what he can do for us. 
Now, if I don't make any other point, I want to make sure we get that one down because there's a reason why we do that and there's a way that we can fix it. But sometimes we have this tendency to seek after Jesus for loaves instead of love. Are y'all with me this morning? Amen? <laughs> sometimes we seek after Jesus for loaves instead of love. Now, we have to kind of take this into consideration, the fact that we are in American culture, where when we talk about bread and all of that stuff, that for us, bread is a side dish. It's something that you can have it or you can not have it. Uh, when you go on a diet, one of the first things you do is get rid of bread. But, but we're talking about uh, uh, not just bread in terms of the actual bread itself, but we're talking about bread in terms of the whole subsistence, the whole entire meal, the main thing. So we kind of have to put it into American perspective. If, if I were in the South, Jesus, instead of saying, I am the bread of life, Jesus would say, I am the collard greens of life, or I am the fried chicken of life, or I am the beans and rice of life. But whatever it is, the point Jesus was trying to make in this whole entire scripture is how important and central he is to every single thing that we do. That makes sense? And so we find ourselves in these situations sometimes where we're really looking for Jesus, not because of who Jesus is, but because of what Jesus could do for us. I look for Jesus in order to bless my finances. I'm struggling a little bit, and I want Jesus to bless me so that I can be able to pay my bills. I'm looking for Jesus because I need a wife or I need a husband. And if I find Jesus, then maybe I can find that special person who's going to fit my life. I look for Jesus because I want success on my job. I look for Jesus because I need him just for a little bit more fame, a little bit more popularity, a little bit more recognition in what I do. Instead of looking for Jesus because I love him, I'm looking for Jesus because of what he can do for me. And we have to be careful because new and old believers alike have a tendency to cross that line. And it's a dangerous line to cross, and it's so subtle we don't always see it. Think about the things you pray about in the morning or in the afternoon or in the evening. What does your prayer sound like? Is it, is it this long laundry list of things that I need Jesus to do for me? Or is it this simple adoration and praise and worship and recognition of who my God is? What is your prayer life saying about you and your relationship to God? You, you think about it in, in, in terms of your own children if you have them. What is it like when, when your children only come to you when they need something? They only come to you when there's something that they want. They only come to you when there's something that they need. It says something about their relationship with you. They only see you as a provider. But what about when your child just wants to be in your presence? What about when your child just wants to be around you? And, and let's be honest, as parents, no matter how old your children have gotten, don't you miss those days when they cried on your way out the door? Come on now. When they hated to see you leave, you miss those days. Because in those days, that love was so pure. That love was so honest. That love was so powerful. It just overtook them because of the love that they had for you. And here's what God is calling us to. He said, return to that first love. Make sure you return to that love that you had for him before. What God is all about you. It's all about you, not just what you can do for me. But at the same time, I get it. I get it. Because you know what, as a, as a young man growing up in church, let me be, just be a little bit more transparent here with you. As, as a young man growing up in church, I grew up in the Missionary Baptist Church. Most of you probably never heard of that. But Missionary Baptist is, is, is an interesting denomination. And I grew up in it as a young man. It's tough for me to describe it in, in terms of theology and give you a definite term. But, but the best way I can put it is this. Missionary Baptists, where I'm from, tend to take the best of both worlds from the Southern Baptists and the Pentecostal. They take the structure and the educational components from the Southern Baptists, but they take the show enough good time from the Pentecostal. And they mix that together, and you get what we call Missionary Baptists. So it was decent, it was in order, but man, those folks knew how to have a good time in church. The problem was, as, as a kid, these churches were small. There was no such thing as children's ministry. Children's ministry was your mama's pocketbook strap. <laughs> you, you sit there, you be still, you be quiet, and you listen to the preacher. No, not dare try to get up and go to the bathroom while he's talking. <laughs> that was children's ministry. 
church as for me as a kid was hard because we had to sit through some long services. And not only that, you, you would go to church that morning, early in the morning, because my mama always had to be in Sunday school. You go to church early that morning. And then you think, man, maybe we're going to get to leave soon. No, 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 no. 1030, we have the actual worship service. All right. Then after about 1.30 in the afternoon, you think, man, we're finally ready to go home. And, and they, sometimes they trick you a little bit because at, at 1.30, you actually get in the car. You actually get in the car. And, and then mama would drive to another church. <laughs> so just when you thought you're getting home, you go to another church and we start this whole thing all over again. <laughs> And I learned as a kid, every time somebody said, hey, man, praise God, hallelujah, the preacher would take another 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs> Church was tough as a kid. It was tough as a kid. But you know what my favorite services were? My favorite services were the ones where they said, we're going to have some refreshments afterwards. <laughs> I didn't mind going to church on those days. And, and man, sometimes see, these churches were small. And somebody will open the door that led to the kitchen, and you smell that chicken cooking in the kitchen, and it come whiffing all through the sanctuary to the middle of the service, and man, you get ready. Those were my favorite services. And I was the holiest kid. I never got popped on the days when we had that food in there. Because <laughs> I, I knew I was going to have my belly full when we got finished. But you know what, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit of secret here. This is why I, I, I pick on people so much. This, this is why I pick on Pastor Brian so much. Because when I was in church, me and my siblings, picking on the people around us became a matter of survival. It was tough because you had to sit through all these long services. So we survived by making fun of the people that, that were around us. We survived by, 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 by looking at sister so-and-so and how she was cutting the food in the service. We go home and we imitate these people. I go home and I imitate Pastor Brian now. You know, <laughs> oh, man. I, 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 I said I was going to stop doing it. <laughs> but he does give you some interesting quirks. For, for example, if you're ever in a conversation with Pastor Brian, I'm going to give you a few tips for how to recognize what's on his mind. You can always tell what Pastor Brian is thinking by his glasses. Now, stay with me here. Stay with me here. He starts the conversation with the glasses on. He's listening to you. But then you got to watch what he does after that. If he takes the glasses off, one or two things is about to happen. <laughs> I, either he's fixing to chew you out or that conversation is about to get really deep. But if he takes the glasses off and he chewed on the end of it, <laughs> that means there's something wrong with your theology. <laughs> <laughs> and he's trying to find a pastoral way to tell you. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, my, my, my. <laughs> Here's my point. Let me move on. I never get to preach again. <laughs> the, the point we, I'm trying to make in all of this is that, that physical sustenance may profit us a little, but spiritual sustenance has eternal gains. That physical sustenance may hold you for a little while, but the spiritual sustenance has great gains. So Jesus was saying, you're working so hard to find this stuff that's not really going to hold you. Let me point you to something that's going to hold you for all eternity. Paul alluded to this in 1 Timothy when he said, having nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope Set on the living God. Now watch this. Who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Especially those who believe. Jesus alluded it too when he said in Matthew chapter 4 verse 4, he said, man shall not live by what? 
bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from what? The mouth of God. That's what I tell my children every time they come to me talking about their home. Right? I tell them that man does not live by bread alone. Go get in the word. But Jesus is making a powerful point that you have to learn to think beyond your belly. You have to learn to think beyond the demands of your body. If you're ever going to do a great thing for God, you cannot live according to your sensory mechanism. You have to go beyond that. So then we finally get to the scripture in John chapter 6, verse 32. He says, Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Everybody say life. life. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Stay with me. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes, everybody say believes, in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. They said, it's not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know. How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. I told y'all he gave me a lot of verses. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes, everybody say believes, believes. has eternal life. I am the bread of of life. Watch this. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. I'm going to pause there for a minute because listen to me. What Jesus is doing here is, is not bragging. It's very important when you consider the religious mindedness of a lot of the people that Jesus was addressing. Because religious people has this tendency to take everything they hear and religionize it. I don't know if that's a real word, but I think you get the point of that. They, they make everything religious. Everything. I ever tell you all about that time. There was a, a, a lady that, that, that came into a restaurant and, and she ordered some fried chicken. And, and she, she started walking out the door and just took the box of fresh fried chicken and threw it in the trash can. A friend of mine went up to her and asked her, what? why did you do that? She said, that, that was a spirit on that chicken. And she couldn't eat that chicken because that was a spirit on the chicken. Religious people will religionize everything. But what Jesus is doing here is he's making some points very, very clear. Because what these people had the tendency to do was they took everybody who came and they would compare them to Moses and Abraham. Moses and Abraham was always their standard of who was good, 
or who was from God or who they would believe. Moses and Abraham. It was always Moses and Abraham. So when Jesus came, he had to make sure that he identified himself as being higher than Moses and Abraham before Abraham was I am. Y'all hear me? Moses didn't even give you the manna. My father gave you the manna. And now he's giving you the real manna. Am I making sense to y'all this morning? Did y'all hear what I'm saying? So Jesus had to distinguish himself from everybody else they could possibly compare him to. He, he said, I am the authentic one. And even they recognized it at one point. They recognized that Jesus, when he taught, did not teach as one of the scribes or the Pharisees or whoever. But the Bible says that when he spoke, he spoke as one having what? Authority. Authority is authenticated power. He was the real source, and there was something different about it, and folks could recognize it. So Jesus distinguished himself, I am the real bread that came down from heaven. The bread that you even think Moses gave you, they ate it and they still died. But when you take in this bread that I'm offering, it's going to give you eternal life. He says in verse 51, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And that's a hard statement for some people because he elevated himself to the position of Almighty God. And even, even in the, you, when you read the scripture a little bit closer, you find out that there were some of his own people that walked away from him at that point. And he even turned to his disciples and he said to them, are y'all going to leave me too? And Peter spoke up and he said, Lord, we ain't going nowhere. We recognize that what you are offering us, we can't get anywhere else. Peter said, we recognize the authenticity of what you do. And how many of you recognize that once you've had the best, you can't try the rest? Am I right? Once you've had the real thing that, that God has to offer you, all that fake stuff just doesn't matter anymore. Man, I'm, I'm in that, that season of my life. I got uh, my, 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 my young daughter, Elisha. I, I still remember the day she was born, and I watched her grow up as a little girl. But, but we're in that, that phase of life <sighs> that I dreaded coming a long time ago. We ended that, that phase of life where now all of a sudden, boys become interesting. <laughs> and, and I'm telling you, you have to understand me as, as a father, I, I am ridiculously overprotective. And I will admit it, I probably need some therapy. <laughs> I am extremely overprotective of my girls. I'd be the same way with Siomi, the, the little one, the two-year-old, the same way. I'm very overprotective when it comes to my little girl. But, but, but the problem I have with this, this stage of life is, 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 is that the boys for a season now seem to be even more important than you. And as, as a dad, I can't handle that. So I tell her all the time, when you get a boy that measures up to me, <laughs> then you got the right one. As long as he don't measure up to daddy. He don't look as good as me. He ain't as smart as me. He can't treat you like he ain't worth it, baby. Just keep on going. And then I have to tell him, listen, I am the last man on earth like this. <laughs> You'll never find another me. Ah. So my point in this is, when you have the real thing, the real standard, set that standard high. And that's all I'm trying to communicate to my daughter. Set your standard high. Set your standard so high that in order for a man to achieve it, he's got to come through Jesus. Y'all hear me? That's what we're going for. And once I've tried him, 
I can't try anything else. So if, if I had to quickly summarize all of what Jesus was really compelling us to do in this scripture, there are three major things that he compelled us to do in this scripture. The first thing he compelled us to do is that we need to learn of him. Second thing he compels us to do is that we need to believe on him. And the third thing he compels us to do is that we need to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. Go back just a little bit. In verse 43, he said, do not grumble among yourself. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. That that word learn is significant because learn doesn't just mean to to gather information, to get information. Learn means to study, to pursue, and to be preoccupied with. Because the type of learn here is not the type of type of learning that we're used to in our in our society. We're used to learning something to spit out on the test, to make a grade, and to move on. For, for, and that's why a lot of us, when we leave school, we stop learning. Because learning means that the, the main reason why I'm doing this is because I need to memorize it for a little while, spit out on the test, make a grade, and move on. Now that I've made all of my grades, I don't learn anymore. That's exactly what the enemy wants from you. To stop learning. In the kingdom of God, anything that is not growing is dead. So the word learn here is an active word. It means I am studying Jesus to understand everything I can about him. I'm trying to figure out. It's an intense word. It's a very intense term. And, and, and I'm trying hard to understand my God. I'm pursuing him. It, but, but it's also not dabbling in Christ. And, and that's what a lot of people do. They, they, they come to church. They'll try it out. Ah, oh, that, that ain't for me. It doesn't, it doesn't fit me. The, 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 the worship style doesn't fit me. I don't, I don't like the way that pastor teaches. And, and I, I don't like the way these people dress when they go to church. They, they dabble in it. And then they move on. Jesus said, you'll never figure me out that way. If, if that's your way of doing it, then you're not fit for the kingdom of God. You know how much stuff we miss out on with God because we're dabbling in all this petty stuff that doesn't even really matter to him? We miss out on the great things of God because we're focused on things that doesn't even matter. We get caught up in little details and little issues that does not even matter, show up on God's relevant scale. Because something isn't going the way we want it to go. We dabble in it. We mess with it a little bit. We want Jesus, that ain't what I want. Jesus is talking about a deep, intense knowledge, a deep, intense pursuing and seeking and going after him to a point of revelation. See, having information is not enough. There has to be a point where there are some revelation of who God is. The Bible says it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. But it is the glory of kings to search it out. So God has a way of hiding mysteries about himself. And we have to have a way of searching out those mysteries of God. Jesus even defined it this way. When he talked about eternal life, because all of us want eternal life. We want to die and we want to go to heaven. We want to live for eternity. Jesus defined eternal life for us. He said in John chapter 17, verse 3, and this is eternal life. Look at this. Look at this. And this is eternal life, that they know you. Amen. The only, and that's an important word there, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you see. So if you don't know him, you do not have eternal life. And this is where we got to be careful. Because I can sit in church all of my life and still not know him. I can know the scriptures from the beginning to the end and still not know him. I can be wealthy beyond my dreams and I can do anything I please and, and still not know him. Church, we cannot miss that. 
It's possible to fake religion, but you can't fake relationship because at some point this thing is going to show up. This thing must become real to me. I must have this relationship with him. Second thing he told us was believe. Verse 47 said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Whoever believes has eternal life. Whenever I, I, I talk about the subject of belief, there is an operational definition that, that I like to use to really help this definitely expand. Because sometimes when we talk about belief, we think that it just means to, to hope in something or to have some type of remote idea that something might be real. But belief goes much deeper than the surface. It goes much deeper than head knowledge of something. It goes much deeper. And I think Pastor Brian put it best uh, when he spoke a couple of weeks ago. He, he said, if, if you say you believe something, but don't do it, guess what? You don't believe it. You say you believe something and don't do it, then you don't believe it. So here's, here's a definition of belief. It means to possess an internalized conviction that transformed the mind, will, and intellect. It transforms your mind, how you think, how you perceive the world, how you look at it. It transforms your will, which are your desires, things you want to do. What, what did Jesus say? I did not come to do my own will, but to do what? The will of him who, who sent me. You, you talk about food. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. My subsistence, the thing that keeps me alive, is doing his will. So when you have a belief, your very desires that are in you begin to change. It begins to shift. Your will becomes lesser important as you give yourself over to doing his will. It even changes your intellect. Faith in God makes you smarter. You know why? Because when you put your faith in God, he aligns you with his will for your life. And there's nothing smarter than a person who is fully carrying out the purpose for which they were designed. When you get in that position and you're doing those things that God has called you to do and you're doing it for his glory, you become a genius in what God has called you to. You become magnificent. You become a wonder in what God has called you to because you are where you are supposed to be. It changes your intellect. But what makes some of us look stupid is that we're doing things we were not designed to do. And let's admit it. How many of you in this room can play basketball? Nobody? <laughs> so imagine if you got on the court, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I watched basketball during the 90s. It has not been that good since then, so my reference here is purely from that perspective. Let's say I put you on the court with Michael Jordan. How good are you going to look on the court with Michael Jordan? You're going to look terrible, aren't you? That ain't what you were designed to do, but that's what he was designed to do. Y'all get me here. So some of you measure your level of intelligence based on the position that you're not supposed to be in. But if you do what God has called you to do and place your will in his hand and say, God, not my will, but yours be done, you're going to look like an Einstein. Y'all hear me this morning. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must do what? Believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. See, that word exists, I love it, because it's the same word that Jesus used when he said, I am the bread of life. That, that phrase, I am, is just a conjugation of the infinitive verb to be. We don't hardly recognize that verb to be because we don't usually use it in that sense. But when you conjugate that verb, you get I am, he is, she is, we are. The verb to be simply means to exist. So when God says I am, 
It means he is the self-existent one. And that he does not rely on any other source, any other form of power to perform what he does. It's a powerful word. It means you have to believe that he is the self-sufficient one. And that he rewards those who do what? Seek him. Remember what the word learn means? It means to study, to pursue, to be preoccupied with. It means to be going after him. And I'm not going after him just to get my blessing. And there's all kind of preachers out there now that preach this prosperity gospel. And they're messing folks up. Because they make the gospel out to be, come and get Jesus and he's going to bless you with this. Come and get Jesus and he's going to give you this. Come and get Jesus, he's going to give you a husband, give you a wife, give you money, give you cars. Make your life so wonderful. When you come to Jesus, I know why they do it, but it's wrong. Because Jesus is saying that you missed the whole entire point. All those signs, all the miracles, all the wonders, all the blessings, all those things are only designed to point you back to him. We want the root, not, not the fruit. I don't want to be dependent on somebody else's blessing my whole entire life. I want to have my own relationship with him because he's the only one that's going to always be there. When I'm in my life in a corner in the dark and things are not going very well. Even David said it, my, my mother and my father can forsake me, but my God will always be there. I got to believe it. I got to believe it. People who learn facts about God but don't really believe it are like those in the parable of the sword that fell on stony ground. They like the information. They like the sound of it. And they jump on it real fast. But when those difficult times come, they fade away. You know, another good example of belief is kids checking the refrigerator for food. You ever been in that little no man's land between trips to the grocery shop where in that period of days, that really ain't nothing in there, but maybe it's some, some cheese and a jar of pickles and their sweet relish that ain't nobody gonna really eat. But, but, but your kids, especially if they're teenagers, they, they will go in there every 10 minutes <laughs> looking in the refrigerator. I ain't coming there, open the refrigerator, let all that air out, running up your electric bill. <laughs> then they close it. 15 minutes later, they come back, they open it again. Hey, right, what do you expect to happen here? <laughs> so I, was, I was messing with Elisha last night. I was, I was in the living room uh, just, just doing my thing. And, and I saw her come into the kitchen. And I, I recognized the look that was on her face. It, it's that daddy, I'm hungry look. And I was standing there and I, I told her, I said, Elisha, don't look in here. I pointed to the refrigerator. Ain't nothing in there. Then I walked up to the cat. I said, Elisha, don't look in here. Ain't nothing in there. That's some dry pasta and you ain't going to cook. She opens the freezer. <laughs> she pulled out some ice cream. <laughs> and bless God, somebody had went and gotten some ice cream. See, that's, that's what it is. I figured it out. They know that at some point, they might not have seen food go in, but if they keep on checking that refrigerator, <laughs> there's this hope. There's this hope beyond this hope. There's this hope and that's belief that somehow some food is going to pop up in there. That girl checked that freezer, that ice cream was in there. I saw her get happy. <laughs> oh, we're going grocery shopping today. <laughs> Paul put it this way. Bear with me. This is, this is a lengthy scripture, but it's powerful enough to share with you. Paul put it this way. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, he said, are, are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman with far 
greater labors, far more imprisonment with countless beatings and often near death. He said, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. 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 You know, I heard somebody put it in a very, very powerful way. Yeah, God promised you, he, he didn't promise the boat. He, he promised you that he would always be there for you. He didn't promise you the boat would always be there. He, he, he promised you that, that he would always be there for you. He, he didn't promise the bank account would always be there. He, he promised you that he would always be there for you. He, he didn't promise that your means of transportation would, would always be there. So, so don't get discouraged when the material things around you seem to fall apart. God never promised the material things to begin with. He said, I will be with you. Lo, I will be with you even to the end of the age. Y'all hear me? This is why you got to believe. This is why you got to believe. Because I'm telling you, if you don't believe, there's a point where the boat is going to fall apart. Oh, my God. There is a point where the very thing you think you have to hold on will, will fall out from underneath you. But it's in that very moment where when I believe what I believe, I will refuse to be discouraged. I will refuse to hang my head low. And even if I fall down, bless God, I will get right back up again because I know what my God has promised me. I have to believe. You got to believe. And this belief has to go beyond just what you see. It has to be all the way deep inside, rooted in your faith. The Bible says the just does not, does not live by what they see. They don't live by what they hear, but they live by faith. They live by what they know about their God, and they believe on him. Paul said this too. He said, so we do not lose heart, though the outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen, he says, are eternal. It's eternal. And your, your religion doesn't impress me, but your faith to remain steadfast and your focus on him does. And I'm going to tell you something, I know some people with some God-given determination. I want to share one of them with you because I'm almost out of time and I want to share anything else. I want to share this with you. You know, Mike Hill does not have a perfect life. I want to give you that qualifier right now. I've had to start over again and again and again and again. I had to figure things out early on in my life. I, I couldn't agree with Jacob when he told Pharaoh that my life has been short and filled with struggle. But, but you know what? I count it all joy because of something that a powerful woman, I call her mama, something that a powerful woman gave me. You know, I thought about it since I became a parent. I always wondered, how did my mama do it? She never imposed her belief on me. She never forced, now she did force me to go to church, but that's different. She never forced her faith on me. There was never a point where she sat me across from the table and, and, and said, Mike, you're going to believe this word no matter what. She never imposed it on me. So I tried to figure out how was my mama so good at what she did. And the more I thought about it, because I wanted to implement it as a parent myself. Because I'm going to tell you something. My children, my birth children, my blood, they obey my mama better than me. For a long time before I got married, I was a single father. I couldn't get Elisha to do her hair like a woman's supposed to do her hair. That was a long time ago. I couldn't get her to do it. 
When I said, Grandma Prina is about to come over to the house, that girl went to go. She got that hair right. That, that was a hole that my mama had, a power that she had to move and to motivate people, to do what she needed to do. She read had left the finger. I didn't understand how my mama did it. And as I thought about it, I realized something. She never had to tell me because she was always showing me. I used to watch my mama. And let me qualify this statement too, because it's important to me. I love my father. I love my daddy. Don't, don't, I, I admire the man. I look up to him. I love my daddy. But I can still remember very vividly as a little boy watching my daddy beat on my mama. And, and let me tell you something. You have any idea what it feels like as a little kid, too little to make any difference at all, to have to jump on the back of a big old man and beat him as hard as you could, trying to get him off your mama. And say, you feel helpless. You feel hopeless. You feel like there's nothing in the world you could do. I, I remember the days when my mama would turn all the lights off in the house and tell me and my sisters to go and hide in the closet, trying to pretend like we weren't home because my daddy had gotten drunk. He was looking for my mama. He was going to beat on my mama again. Any idea what it feels like to sit in the closet and hear windows breaking, doors being banged on, somebody trying to get to your mama, and the overprotective man, see, I was overprotective long before I had Elisha. The overprotective man that I was, the little boy I was, I needed to fight for my mama. Couldn't do anything. But let me tell you something. I watched my mama step through the difficulty. I watched my mama grow through the pain. I watch my mama say, I've had enough. I watch my mama straighten up her back. And she taught me a man can't ride your back unless it is bent. I watch my mama go through seasons of hardly having nothing and taking care of three kids on her own. I watched her. I watched her fight. I watched her claw. I watched her work hard. I remember the days my mama would be sick, still go to work. I never forget the time my mama was cooking, some oil popped off the stove, hit her in the leg. She had this huge, Huge swelling on her leg. She still got up the next day and went to work because she had to do it for her kids. I watched her. I watched her. I watched my mama pray. I watched my mama get in the word. I watched my mama confess her faith. I watched her do all of these things over and over and over and over again. She was just a hard-working woman. And she put it in me that if there's anything you want to accomplish in life, if you just have the faith and you believe it enough, you will overcome any adversity. You will overcome any trial. No matter what man might throw at you, you are going to make it. That's what she showed me. That if you live out this faith, not enough to just read the Bible, not enough to just know some verses. She said, is that enough? You stick with him 
no matter how hard this thing may get, no matter how difficult it may come. And that woman buried her faith. It's in there. It's rooted. So here's what happens. I go through my little life time and time again, tested over and over and over and over. Listen, so many times in life I've been knocked down. So many times in life I've been crippled. So many times in life I had to suffer setbacks. But every single time that faith rises up and says, you've got to believe. It's a powerful word. If you look at your notes, the end of this sermon is already written out. There's nothing to fill in. I knew long ahead of time that I wasn't going to finish this. <laughs> but that's one point. That's one point. And I want you to make sure you keep in mind. God is not only bigger than your problems, your mistakes, and your failures. He planned for them. It's all a part of his plan. He knew you were going to mess up. He knew you were going to fall short. You need to believe. Anything that's hindering you, anything that's holding you back, it's nothing to be compared to what God will do in your life and do through your life if you just believe. Let me pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you glory. In the name of Jesus, we honor you. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Help, Father, even our unbelief that we might be able to lift you up, that we might be able to call upon you, and that we might have a transforming relationship with you. Let your name be praised. Let your name be honored. Let your name be magnified. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.